You know that old expression, I'm going to die with my boots on? Well, the new version of that is, I'm going to die with a negative social credit score. Because that, <laughs> that means that I've done everything right in my life. <laughs> that's the new, that's the new honourable death. Die with a negative social credit score. Okay, let's talk about the more she, the fairies, the others, whatever you want to call them. About six or seven years ago, at a university, uh, a university in Lisbon, in Portugal, and the University of Durham in England, had a combined research program where they wanted to find out how old fairy tales are and they used a software program that's used to find the ancient path of seeds so plants that were hybrids and how they germinated they were able to tell what was the core plant by following its genetic material they just re-tinkered software to get elements in European fairy tales and instead of having a, a DNA sequence they would find elements from the fairy tales motifs stories, archetypes again, and find out how old the fairy tales were. And what they found was absolutely staggering. They found out that European fairy tales go back as far as the Bronze Age. Stories like Jack and the Beanstalk goes back to the Bronze Age. And there was other elements too. Anything to do with a smith or a smithy. Ancient, ancient. So our fairy tales have been around incredibly long periods of time but they were used as a form of training children to understand the dangers of the world without frightening them so Hansel and Gretel is really about pedophiles to, to sweets from a stranger uh, Little Red Riding Hood is about uh, sexual assault the, the Red Riding Hood represents the menstrual cycle and predatory men coming after them and it was a way of teaching them at an early age of the the dangers, the, the dangers of the world, without actually frightening the children, and that's why they're very important. Now, in the Irish tradition, we had a strong fairy folklore that served a similar purpose. That, I'll give you an example, when I went to America, I had met people, and they say, "Oh, I'm fascinated by the fairies in Ireland." I says, "Oh, yeah." And then they would start talking about Tinkerbell, Disney type things, you know. And that's okay because they don't know. They don't have that, and they don't have our culture to call back on. It was all they knew. And I realized there was something kind of sinister to that. They were taking the archetypes and they were polluting. And I said, oh no, the Irish don't have a feeling like that. I've actually had really weird encounters on this stuff. And uh, like I remember I did a talk once in America. And this woman's going on, but the fae, the fae, oh, uh, the fae, you know. And I said, no, the fae are English fairies. What do you mean? No, the fae are English fairies. In Ireland, we have the she, S-I-D-H-E, and they're a different species. And they were like, what? Huh? And, you know, uh, and they're all, like, here to help us. No, they're just like people. There's good ones and there's bad ones. But what you have to understand is that when you encroach upon their world like we are today, that you're coming into someone's home. Remember when I spoke earlier on about the sanctity of the, the sacred space. So you're actually in someone's home. And I often, I saw this, I, I was in Texas about seven years ago. I did an event there. And there was these two guys there, and they were from, and they were asking me what I was into. And I said, well, I'm here to talk about whatever. I think I was talking about European folk magic. Who are you? And they go, you don't know who I am? No. We're TV ghost hunters, you know. And it was weird. Really like you looked at me, like you know, you know who you're talking to. I says, yeah, you're a, you're a, you're a gobshite who runs around with an infrared camera, going, what the fuck are you, Jesus Christ, and all this kind of thing. And you call yourself a ghost hunter. And I, and I said, I'm gonna have fun with this guy. I'm gonna have fun with this guy. So I said, what are ghosts? And he goes, well, you know, they're they're part of spirits, dead and they're trapped on this earth, you know, the usual cliché. And I said, have you ever considered that some of them actually might be demons? And under Islamic folklore, there's a thing called the jinn. And they're like a kind of a fairy race, but they exist in the Islamic world, and they're quite hostile to human beings as a general case. 
and they live in sequestered places like old abandoned hospitals, cave mines, shafts, all this thing. And that what you were thinking was the ghost of, you know, Eric the Skull Miner. It was actually an entity that was very dangerous to you. And he looked at me like he wanted to shoot me. Because he, for the first time in his life, his assumptions were challenged by another opinion. And also he probably saw me as like unloading, his, you know, wrecking his, his scam. So I looked up this guy's t- this, these guys when I got back home on the internet. And sure enough, they had a popular TV show. Ghost Gob Shites or something it's called. You know, there's hundreds of those. There's hundreds of those shows on there. And they're all the same. They're all running around with an infrared camera screaming. I mean, it, isn't it hilarious how they want to say a ghost so much that when they see when they go, ah, they all run out. You know? <laughs> the only one I ever loved was Derek Akora. I actually absolutely thought he was wonderful. I loved, I loved his shows and I loved the man. And uh, he was from a time when you had to have talent to be on TV. And I was very sad when he died. And uh, you'll always remember that time he was in the pub in England and he was talking about someone called Richard and Mary and he was going in his thickest scouse accent, Mary loves dick, Mary loves dick and he's pretending to be in a to be in a trance. And it was just so it was so charming, it was so wonderful, you know. There was just something beautiful about that guy. I loved him. And uh, but the American ones it's all screaming and running around, pretending you've seen the ghost and stuff like that. And so I looked online and funny enough, where were they? Down the road from me in Lysheen House in Sligo. It was just like one of Ireland's most famous haunted houses. But it's also known for fairy activity because there's three circular enclosures on the same land. And I think the so-called ghost experience is actually related to that. And they were they were running around screaming in this place like fairy activity over here and running like this thing. And it was so disrespectful. And then I realized these people are horrible. They're actually going into places where graveyards or where prisons where people died, uh, and maybe even to like into places like this, and they're sensationalizing it and profaning it and 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 this, this, you know just basically degrading it for money. And the more the more the more they see a light on the horizon, they'll make out that it's some kind of ghost or something, screaming and cursing and all this stuff. And it taught me a great lesson uh, that these fellas are all pretty much in great danger. They're probably messed with their souls because they've, they've offended something out there. So remember that. When you come into a... I don't have to tell you guys, but I'm just saying in general. If you were ever... Anyone's watching the videos or whatever. If you were ever go to a place where they're told that the she or whatever, or the fae in England, whatever, and uh, be respectful. They're not clowns or characters to entertain you you're in someone's home I mean I'm not going to go into your home and say you know can you can you juggle a ball for me you know can you hold a pint of Guinness on top of your head while you tell while you sing you know ring a ring a rope no you're not going to do that so remember you, deal, you have to have respect and that's it I learned that from dealing with people from the Islamic world who and, and the jinn that they take that very very seriously that's big time big time take that seriously and the whole thing is that you don't go in there trying to make... Because what you do, if you go in there saying... And you get... I'll tell you something. You go into these... You get these, a lot of these new age types. Of course, none of you are like that. But... Those types that are... I've seen them go into these places. I'm channeling the Fae. The Fae are on my side. They're going to do what I want. And all this kind of thing. And you're basically... You're basically ordering a force in nature you don't really understand. You have to be careful. You have to be like it's like going to someone's house and saying, "Do something for me." You can't, you can't do that. You have, to, you know, it's like, it's like a paganism. You don't, you, and a paganism, you don't invoke a god. You don't tell a god to come. To, I command this god to come down because they'll destroy you. A, a mortal has no capacity to bring down a god. It's just like you're, you're going to order Thor or Odin or, you know. Maca or the Morrigan down and they do it, they do these things and they, they, they put themselves in great danger spiritual danger by doing it and that's what I love about what Pat does he almost humanises the she in a way that he respects their personalities and their individuality it's really important you're not dealing with stereotype or a cartoon you're dealing with 
another life form on this planet. I really do believe that. That there are multi, you know, this is not this is not just all Irish thing. It's all over the world. That alongside this reality, where we this, our five sense experience and especially our nervous system. Remember, I said earlier on, your nervous system keeps everything, plugs you into this, right? There's a whole other part of the spectrum that we don't see. We might get to see it in the corner of our eyes. You might be walking through that field and see that grey lady, who you should treat respectfully, and you get a glimpse of the other world. It might happen in dreams, a perfect dream. It might happen in an, a, an insight. It might be, I'll give you an example. From it often allows you to peer into the other world. Uh, years ago, I read a book. Uh, it was about a woman who, and this is what this changed my whole concept of aliens and flying saucers. Her husband had come home from work and told her he was leaving her. And she goes, "What?" And he goes, "It's over. I met someone else. I'm out of here." She came out of blue for the poor woman. Of course, she went into a state of shock. She walked out into her backyard, and there was a UFO hovering over the backyard. And that was because she generated that through her nervous system. She peered into another reality. The trauma and the shock opened up the veil to the other world. And this is why these things are often commonly experienced during battles. Did you know that during the Battle of the, the Battle of Clontarf, the annals report that the, the, the Norse saw the Valkyries and the Irish saw the Bay of the Morrigan battling in the sky. Trauma and fear. During World War One, there was a thing called the Angel of Mons, where they saw a gigantic angel over the uh, the battlefield. Trauma is a way to get through. That's why through the most difficult periods in your life, you often, or even through medical things, like if you had a terrible operation or something, you, you, you sometimes will break through the veil. Pain will actually make you see the other things on the other side. And so that is what that is. These are complementary realities next to this one they're there and the best example I can use is because there's so much body of work in it it's the jinn in the Islamic world and they believe that the jinn are just the same way Pat talks about fairies they have to eat they have to live they have to do the same things they live in a different space time continuum than us and they have a life expectancy that's very different but still it's their, their life they can enter our world, but we can't enter into their world until something goes wrong or it's, it's uh, triggered something. Now, this happened to me a few years ago, and I actually streamed it live on Facebook, on YouTube. I had a fairy stray experience, and I never believed, not I didn't believe in the fairy stray. It was like one of those things, like, it wouldn't be nice to have it, that kind of thing. And I was in a wood, Strand Hill in County Sligo, where I used to do on a Sunday morning sometimes upload videos on live to YouTube. From the same spot every week I knew every tree, every thicket, every bushel, every vine, every piece of grass, and in a place inside out. And I even knew some of the birds like the elves and stuff where they live and the squirrels. And I was making the video and I turned around and I was in a completely different forest. It was a nut. It was now. I didn't walk anywhere. I didn't go anywhere. I just turned around. And I was. Like, I was. I was in a different world. And I was still online, so I streamed, and I could not find where I had to get back to get out of the forest. It didn't exist. The path wasn't there. The trees were all completely different. There was less uh, pine trees and more things like ash trees like that. And then it dawned on me, I'm actually having a fairy stray experience. I'm in this forest, but not this the version of this forest that I'm used to. And it was one of those sort of seeing is believing things, like then you say to yourself, I've experienced that I can no longer deny it. Now, what some, a lot of people do, a friend of mine passed away not too long ago, cancer. He told me that his father had had was walking by Ben Bulbin in Sligo one day and suddenly he was in a different place. He was walking everything looked different. There was a different house. There was different houses, different buildings, different different everything. It was all different. And then it got normal again after a little while. 
and he went home and told the wife that I was just in fairyland. I was just uh, in a different reality. I was in the, where the fairies live. And she said, oh, my grandfather had that as well to happen to him. He just found himself up that the buildings were different and everything was in the wrong place. And, and then it was bad for a few minutes, it got better again. Now, my friend who died and was telling me this, and he was an old-fashioned communist, you know, from the kind of James Connolly uh, trade union end of things. So he was very kind of like anti-anything like that. And I said, what, 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 what happened to your father? And he goes, oh, he's telling the truth. He was definitely telling the truth. And I said, uh, so he went into fairyland. Oh, no, no, it was just a hallucination. You know, his own father told him he believed him, and he still didn't believe him. John, uh, Robert Anton Wilson, the American, Irish-American writer who lived in Kerry for years, he, he was down in Kerry when there was a whole thing that people were seeing the puka. And the puka was appearing as a giant rabbit, a giant six-foot rabbit. And these people came down from uh, some uni- uh, UCD or Trinity, and he said they were terribly patronising to the local farmers and saying, and they were asked, well, do, you, "Do you really believe in Puka? You know, are you, are you that backward? Are you, you know, this kind of to carry on, right?" And he said he was watching the TV and he fell off, fell off laughing because he goes to this old farmer in Kerry and he goes, uh, "So do you, are you, are you really going to tell me that you believe in Puka?" And he goes. Yes, but the problem is, I'm not sure if the Puka believes in me. And that was a very profound thing, because that was an acknowledgement of different realities, because maybe on the other side, our interdimensional friends, I was saying to someone yesterday, Rose actually, we, we need new language to describe these things. We, you know, we all have our separate things. The jinn, the fairies, the she, the you know, we all have, we need a, a, a word to actually frame that experience. Uh, that we don't have one. Maybe there was a term going around. I think it was created by a writer called John Keel. He wrote the Mothman Prophecy, a fantastic book, by the way, and uh, he called them ultra terrestrials. And I thought that was quite good. But it's still a bit too uh, out there for me. But uh, th- th- that's what these experiences are. Now another story I have. I, I used to go painting with it up on. With a friend, it, it, it was, it was a, a retired guard or detective in Dublin. And we used to go painting together. And we used to go on painting trips around, like, paint the Hill of Hoat and things like that. And he had seen, do you remember the moving statues of Bally Spittle? Remember that? The Virgin Mary statue that was moving in County Cork? And he was an atheist. I mean, for science, he was a guard or detective. He was a forensic guy. And he was down there one of the Sundays when they had the gathering of thousands of people watching the statues. And I said, I said, yes, I was, what was it like? Nothing. And he goes, oh no, the statue moved. I'm like, what? He said, the statue moved. And I said, what, like, do that with finger? He said, no, I was doing this. I was looking around. I said, y- you're taking the piss. You actually saw the statue move like the, the faithful did? Yeah. And it was just a mass solution. Hallucination brought on by the people around me. And I somehow experienced that. And I was like, do you not think there's something supernatural in that? Oh, no, no, it's just science. We don't fully understand it yet. Now, last year, two years ago, my friend John, my buddy John there, we went down to Baddy's Pivotal. And I have to say, that place is incredibly mystical. And it, unbelievably, and the grotto is still there. And, you know, I've been to a lot of these Catholic shrines, like, they have horrible energy. A lot of them quite frightening because all these people I'm not I'm, please don't think if you're a Catholic I'm putting your religion down I'm just saying I, I was raised Catholic I'm just saying that's so I always experience these things but this the energy in Bally Spittle was, was dreamlike it was like the grotto and the little hillside and then it turns out that that was known as a fairy place for centuries before it became a Marian shrine so I'm thinking well the statues moving are they fair is it a fairy trickster thing that what we're dealing with here. Then I went one step further, being the awkward piece of shit that I am. I had to go further, and being pedantic about it. And I discovered that those areas were raided by Barbary pirates, Islamic pirates in the 1600s, and entire populations of Cork were actually spirited away in the night as white slaves by the the Barbary coast pirates who were Muslims. And then I'm thinking to myself, was that a gin that was left in, in Bally Spittle? 
So you see, we're dealing with something that when you step out of your Irish programming, your programming culture, you start to realise that these things are everywhere. And, I, and I'm pretty much convinced, Whitley Stryver wrote a book back in the 80s called Communion, where he documented what, what was portrayed in the movie with Christopher Walken was an alien abduction. But the book is very, very different than the movie. He doesn't refer to them as aliens, he refers to them as visitors. And he believes that they were connected to the Irish fairy folklore thing in upstate New York. And he was experiencing them in a modern form as grey aliens. But they were still the same. They appear to you in a way that your mind can handle it. Now this is some... I, I, I do a Sunday night show, we're on a, a summer break at the moment, with a woman called Sarah Mondaini in England, called Hocus Focus. And we look into these phenomena in a very diff, diff, big level. And a lot of we come to the same conclusion that all these things, it's fairies, aliens, apparitions, they're probably all the same thing. But our minds resolve them in a cultural way we can deal with them. That Now, there was one phenomenal case in England called the Sandown Clown. I don't know if anyone's ever heard about this. It happened in the Isle of Wight. Kids were playing one day and they, they, they met a ten-foot clown. And the clown was friendly. And it, it was a, it had a wooden face, blue eyes, and a pointy hat. And it was, and it said that I'm a kind of a ghost, but I'm not really. And it's more like us. Now, people found out then later. Kids had seen. Do you remember that test card F on the BBC where the little girl was playing X's and crosses, and there was a clown beside her. Whatever that energy force was, it had manifested in front of the children, as clown from the BBC at test card in order for their consciousness to behold something that their nervous system and their consciousness wouldn't have been able to behold now this is fantastic stuff when you think about it because it sort of resolves these concepts into things that are controllable that are understandable and they move with time what appeared as an angel in the Middle Ages appears as a UFO today, as appears as a flying dragon, as appears as this kind of thing. And it starts to make you realize the nature of consciousness is far more complex and hackable and outside these kind of black and white confines that psychology says that this is all you have, you're just a bunch of conditioned nervous systems and you're just, you know, amino acids and proteins inside a skin encapsulate. It's a some we're in the game in a different way. It's very interesting. And when I used to watch Pat's videos on here and I would say, God, this guy this, this guy knows this guy has it. This guy has a sus. He knows he knows what the score is here. He understands working with them. And we have yeah, I can remember being in places like Sri Lanka and feeling the same forces that I felt in places like this or in Bally, Bally, Bally Spittle. The same forces. Uh, that there was something else beyond the visual world out there. And, you know, there they might have called it the Nagas or something like that. Beyond, and that the in the Hinduism, in the Vedic thing, they call it the Maya. It's a, what the Maya is, is a, is a kind of a consensus hallucination that we all share. Has us here. So it's basically the holographic universe. There was a famous book by Michael Talbot back in the 70s where he showed, where he used things like the double slit experiment and uh, uh, quantum theory to show that the, this is none of this is real. It's not actually here. Our nervous system is actually making this. And then we're all sharing this together. So each one of us is like a, we're looking at a TV screen of this reality from ourselves, but we've all agreed upon this. This is a kind of, you know, not directly, but subconsciously. And we're having a shared dream. And that makes you think about things like multi other dimensions and other worlds and stuff. And then you realize that our ancestors knew all this stuff too as well. When they would talk about... Okay, there was a book, there were one of the ancient uh, gospels, not gospels, uh, one of the, the first religious manuscripts of Ireland, I can't remember the name of it, it was found in Stokestown in Scotland. And it says something very interesting. It, it refers to the Irish people's belief in the fairies. And they said, 
fairies don't really exist in Ireland anymore, except for some people who still see them. Very interesting. Like the church had switched off the fairy, the abilities to see the fairies. But some had the, still had the ability to see the fairies. They still were able to experience, experience this world this, this within the, beyond the Maya, beyond the consensus hallucination, that where these experiences and these entities or whatever they are be, belonged. And that was like an admission by the, the monks, the ancient monks, that there, they did exist. They hadn't been eradicated, but they'd gone into the underworld. Now, that's a fairy expression. In Ireland, we use the term other world when we talk about the fairies, the other world. And you say, well, that's another dimension. The, the Christian, you have to remember, a lot of our, all our mythology was written down by Christians, so they couldn't, they couldn't give us the whole story because it would have... Pro- cause problems for their own religion. This is why the Royal Irish Academy has something like 900 books of ancient Irish manuscripts that they have never translate. And they give all kinds of excuses like, well, it's really be a really expensive project. We have what we can't put resources to it. It's only the true history of our race. But they we don't we're not, they, it's all kept from the lock and key. Most of those documents are not in Ireland by the way, they're in London. And uh, they're like gatekeepers on our past, our real past. But when they talk about the other world, the, the other world, it was there's a, there's a Greek term called shatonic, and that means to go under the earth. That somehow they're buried. That's a symbolic. They were symbolically buried. Fairies. They were symbolically buried by the Christians. They went under the other world. They went underground, into the barrows, into the into the hillsides. Now, J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote Lord of the Rings, has something... He had spent a lot of time in Ireland. He was a sitting professor of English at... Uh, of ancient, uh, sorry, of, of European languages at Galway University. And he said something. He said that the, the land of Ireland has a dangerous force in it. And it's only the goodness of the Irish people that keep that force from coming up. As if... I, I was like, what does he really mean by this? Because this guy was no dummy when it came to this stuff. He wasn't saying anything bad about us or anything about our country, but he recognised there was some powerful force under there. And as a devout Catholic, he was kind of worried about it. Well, what did they say? And you, you think you live in a world that's like ordinary and average, right? The story was that the two of they damn come from the barrows and the mounds when Ireland was at its greatest need. What's happening right now? That's why. Why do you think Pat has become an international farm has become an international sensation in recent times? This time, why do you think a sudden interest in all this stuff? It's because our acknowledgement of the others. I'd use that word for now. The others, the good folk, the good people. I'm going to call them. Actually, and Pat said this to me last night. I was like so relieved when he said it generates them deeper into this reality. I can guarantee you everyone here tonight will have more stronger experiences, paranormal experiences, what you call metaphysical experiences, after, after, this, after this weekend. You will. Because you've, you've broken through the veil of the restrictions of, your, of your, your nervous system and your five senses by entering into a kind of a magical state. You've hacked the matrix by sheer thinking of it. By the sheer indulging of it, by the telling the stories of it, by wanting to believe it. Even if you think, I think it's a load of rubbish, but I'm still going to have a look at it. You're still hacking it. You're still, you're, you're, you're breaking a kind of a spell that's been put into you. That's only this and there's nothing else. It's just this material world. And they spoke about the other world. Okay. Now, there's symbiotic relationship that we go in, we have the fairy stray, and people panic. Oh, I'm, I'm trapped here. I'm, tra- I'm finished, you know. And instead of saying, "Oh, thank you for letting me have your, let me have the experience," I, I appreciate this. Or the same thing, when they come into our reality, people run a mile, you know. And you hear these stories of people. I saw this. They saw this fairy around. It's terrified. And I often wonder if our, and I'm not again. Don't think I'm mocking Christianity. I often wonder if our pagan ancestors saw fairies everywhere. And it was only the arrival of Christianity that turned them into a kind of a demon or a devil. I really do wonder about that. And as Ireland moves away from Christianity, 
and that doesn't mean we're becoming godless atheists but we're we're going a lot of us have, a lot of us have returned to paganism some of us have taken an interest in celtic christianity others have taken interest in things like hinduism which is very similar comes from the same the european root as paganism as a european paganism the same archetypes they have the doom of Bate, the the which is the crow goddess that harvests souls and we have the morrigan and the valkyrie they're all they have, the archetypes are always the same they have a thunder god they have indra breaking clouds we have thor and luke loki comes from an ancient european word luki l-u-k-k-e it's a very ancient in the european sanskrit term that means a flash of lightning and it also means a genius experience in your head something you so I often wonder now if our pagan ancestors there if we were having something like this would there be actually the she here with them and they saw them and it's only uh, and as as the rea- as this reality dissolves you see I have like I've got some very good friends who are Christians and I have these kind of friendly philosophical debates with them and I'll say things like uh, you don't believe and I uh, he says why not Thomas you're not afraid of your soul being no and my ancestors didn't come from the Middle East no no I understand why the story of Jesus Christ is very appealing and the gospels fair enough I got that very appealing story it's not my it's not my roots it's not my it's not my my, my archetypal soul is not there it didn't come from the Middle East and they struggle with this you know, we find common ground in that we have this belief that our you know, sacred, you know, there's a sanctity of this land, and that we, regardless of what your religion is or not, we ha- we need to actually feel that sanctity. And that sanctity, this is why I'm also dubious of that kind of nationalist patriotism. You know, that can lead to kind of political patriotism. It's it's, it's beyond that. I mean, I meet people who are members of Sinn Fein who go on like uh, Cullen was a member of the IRA Army Council. You know, they have no concept that Ireland existed before republicanism. They just can't get it into their heads. They just they, they just can't get it into their heads. They think that it was always republicanism right back to the very beginning. It's so weird, but that's how they think. And I say, you know how long republicanism has been in Ireland? About the same time as loyalism. About 200 years, give or take. What are you on about? That's the truth. <laughs> It's around, around the, the loyalists arrived the same time as the republicans and they all bought, they all came from where the grand orient lodge in paris and uh they're quite shocked because they have this in their head that somehow you know the the republican movement of the day of the day has its origins in the far off ancient celtic past you know the dagda you know the morrigan angus Og. it doesn't and that's a program we have to break as well uh, that's we have to understand that those arc those 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 things transcend politics, transcend religion, that they're they're vital aspects of the landscape and of the culture, and they exist in every country. Okay. England is an incredibly tragic story, and I'll tell you why. You know the way like Ireland has kind of like folklore, very rich folklore, Scotland, Wales, Cornwall even, and England doesn't has like Morris dances and I'm not putting Morris dances down but not a lot you know you don't hear much about it right that's because the Normans wiped out English the English folk the, there was a thing called the harrying of the Nord after the Normans arrived in England they made a point of exterminating English folklore and that's why the great tragedy of that was that the English had to kind of rebuild it that's why Tolkien had to write the, his whole mythology to compensate for everything that was lost uh, by the harrying of the north. The, 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 the north of England was basically genocide by the Normans. And uh, the whole culture went with it. And then what was left after that was destroyed in the Industrial Revolution when people went from the, the dales and the valleys of Yorkshire and, and Lancashire and ended up in the mill towns. That, that, that finally finished it off. But even with that, they, these people had a desperate need to try and get back to it. So you had things like even they tried to form kind of new folk movements that were that were honourably displayed in things like Morris dancing, that were harvest moon festivals, even brass bands, you know, the Yorkshire brass bands, it was all part of that. 
They were trying to get culture back. And that's why Tolkien brought the whole thing out of uh, the English, the, 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 the mythological Middle Earth cycle. That was to give the Anglo-Saxon people back what the, the Normans had exterminated. And he took the best of bits of Nordic culture and so on and incorporated it. A lot of the things like the, the ring come from Germanic folklore, the ring cycle and things like that. And we have this need in us and it's always there and we, we have to pull it back to the surface and never let it go and you have to understand that I know this magic is magic is a real thing all magic is is science that manipulates reality in order to achieve changes in the material world and you may think like magic like abracadabra well no it's not like that that's, that's their stereotype Magic is ha taking the will, your your desire, your will, and pu putting it into a pure stream of energy to achieve things that you normally couldn't achieve. An example, a very famous example. We've all heard the story of a car accident and the mother sees her baby underneath, you know, an SUV. And this small woman, so determined to, to rescue her child, will pick up the truck and get the child out right that she's actually transcended reality and that you know and that's called in things like chi and prana in other cultures like the vedic and in chinese but chi prana so on and the child there's things like that there's, you'll have something in your life that you cannot believe it actually happened i can remember when i first went to new york this guy who i didn't I barely knew that i used to work with and I was walking down 7th Avenue and I said, whatever his name was, is around the corner, just popped into my head. And I toured around the corner to 42nd Street and there he was looking at me and he goes, Jesus. Now, how did I do that? Because I was able to step outside present space time and my nervous system somehow, probably because I was being excited by being this young kid in New York and all the energy in that city, that it somehow amplified my nervous system and I was able to sort of like get beyond it. That's all magic is, the ability to take that and it's often a language of science so if you mind control someone that's a form of magic because you've actually made this if, if you work on someone for years and get them to hate themselves it's a form of black magic because you've made them think something that isn't true you have put yourself upon them magic is to take something that is in the that's not in the material world and bring it into the material world if you're simply something like if you're a carpenter and you head you head you imagine you know have this idea for a table that's lined in apple wood but you see it in your mind's eye and then you make it that's magic because it didn't exist in this material world until you used your skills to take it from the subconscious world and manifest in this world now when you understand the simplicity of that concept you make suddenly you're a very powerful person aren't you you're suddenly a very powerful potential that i can actually take something and build it into, so you're a form of god now you should never think you're god or anything like that's you know, I have, I have a big problem with these women who go around, these new age women who go around calling themselves goddesses and stuff like that. Because you imagine a fella going around going, I'm a god. <laughs> and you have all these, I'm the goddess, you know. <laughs> Sweetheart, you're asking for big trouble going around with that kind of hubris. But, um, yeah. And so that, that power is to hack reality. It happens all the time. It's like this... I remember reading a book of war stories years ago on fellas who were at on Omaha Beach on D-Day. It was actually shown, amazingly, it was shown in Saving Private Ryan, where the stress, the stress and the trauma of this horrible event on Omaha Beach, they suddenly were looking around in a dreamland. They went out of space time, and the next thing they knew, they were they were at the beach and not no bullet had penetrated them. And there was people say to them, "What happened? What was Omaha Beach like?" I don't remember. I got off the boat and then I was safe. It's, and that was shown, even in the movie Saving Private Ryan, they show, even kind of show that scene where he goes through a different space time and he sees all the things around him and it doesn't affect him. That was very common reported in high tense, tension battle situations. I, I read a lot about war history and those stories come up, but that's magic. He's, these people somehow transformed themselves out of the reality where they weren't affected by bullets. Why? Because it's all a dream of Maya. Now that doesn't mean, you know, you could say to you guys, pick this thing up 
and drop it on me and I, can, I, won't, I won't affect me. Of course it'll kill me. Why? It's very difficult to hack because the subatomic fabric of the universe is extremely dense. It's, uh, we live in, w our experience of this universe is a subatomic fabric that's incredibly dense uh, y using quantum theorem theory concepts. The ability to transform out of that is what allows the nervous system to actually transform into things and make them happen. And so what you're doing is you're softening up, softening up the subatomic fabric of the universe through your intention or trauma or some other way. And this is why you'll have fellas saying, before the starting pistol even went, I knew I was going to win the gold medal in the Olympics. I just knew it. You hear these stories all the time. I just knew it was going to happen. We've all had these experiences in different ways in our lives. But subatomic, when you can do that, uh, you can actually transform your world and your life in a better way. How? This is why I tell people, don't be watching the evening news. Don't be getting upset. Don't be getting worried. Because these things hold the fabric even tighter. You know, because it's like, the you know what the observer effect is? The double slit experiment where, the, the Copenhagen experiment where they looked at, you, they discovered that if you look at a, a wave, a particle, it's part, it's, it's, it, it becomes a wave, but when you turn your head away, it becomes a particle again. It only exists because we're looking at it. Now that's unbelievable. Why weren't we, t were you told that? I, I don't remember anyone in school teaching me that one. Possibly the most profound scientific experiment in the history of humanity. They discovered that reality is cr created by you looking at it. And literally, what's behind your head probably doesn't exist. It, I know it sounds incredible, but it doesn't. It, it's the observer effect. Then in 2022, this is where people are saying to me about how can we get out of this bullshit, right? 2022 Nobel Prize for Physics was awarded to two gentlemen who discovered a thing called quantum retrocausality. And what that is, and remember, quantum physics is the most, ex, you know, the most tested and retested of any scientific field. Because it's so out there, they were going to say, it has to be bullshit. Test it again, test it again. And they always get this it's an incredibly rigid and reliable form of uh, science. More so than just about anything. And so you can't deny it, it exists. And the retrocausality, quantum retrocausality of the scorebook is, Basically, from what I gather, is they were able to get a subatomic particle and lock it in the past. Then quantum entangle it with another quantum entangle is when you attach two subatomic particles. And it doesn't matter how far away they are. If you put it to the other side of the universe and you move it on that side, it will move, the one here will move. They're quantumly entangled, right? And this, is, this makes you really wonder about when someone has a spell on you or a hold on you, right? And your nervous system. Now, the... The retrocausality, what they discovered was that they could move the, move the two particles entangled, but then they could tell this one that this didn't happen. So basically, the one in the future forgot it. So the past was erased. So this means that the past can be erased. And the science proves that they won the Nobel Physics Prize for it, that the past can be erased. Now this got me thinking about people I knew who did really shitty things in their past. And, it's, and, and, you, and you say to them, he walks around like he never did anything. And never happened. Like parents who are really shitty to their kids. And then they go around telling them, we were the best parents in the world. We were, oh, my kids wanted for nothing. I was the best father. And the kids are like, what? Because he's erased that past where he wasn't such a good guy from out of this reality now you think the potentials of that that you know this is why they never teach us about these things in school because they're kind of like don't give them too much information they might actually have to use it against us that we could okay I'm going let's, I'm going to finish up my my nutso theory um, that I'm currently indulging in my head the 9-11 experience in New York on September 11, 2001, the first time the whole, un the whole human race was, was sent into trauma at the same time. 
we were all watching television. I wasn't, unfortunately, that day. Unfortunately, I wasn't that day. But you know, just about billions of people watching what happened in New York on a TV screen when they saw the most horrific images. Okay, That had never happened in human history before. If you look at a TV broadcast from the day before, 9-11, and the day after, it's two different realities. Two, the people behave differently, look differently. Why? Because we were thrown into a different timeline and a quantum wave function shot up where that became the post 9-11 wave function. And that wave function has now started to deteriorate and we're going back into a kind of a, I wouldn't say a pre 9-11 wave function, but we're going into a, the place at a similar sort of like energetic level that we were before 9-11. See, had 9-11, everyone's their minds were blown, the consensus reality was blown, the Maya was shattered. We had oil wars in the Middle East. We had endless horrors. Oh, the rise of the globalists, right? Then we had, but then it started to die in 2020. The whole COVID thing was really us burying, burying that old world. We're burying the corpse. And I, I look at, I can't, I, I look at the things that's happening in the world at the moment, and it's like, ah, oh, come on now, this is a joke. Like those guys who went down in the submarine, the Titanic. It's like. This is bizarre. The thing was okay. The Titanic was predicted in a book called Futility. About a, three or four years, about ten years before it happened, the ship was called the Titan. It was the same size, carried the same number of passengers as the Titanic. Hit an iceberg and sank. And the Titanic happened, right? That's at the bottom of the sea. And then you have, for some weird reason, people worshiping the Titanic wreck ever since that stupid James Cameron film. Now. They send a submarine down called what? The Titanic. And the Titanic in many ways was the beginning of a kind of globalist world. Because a lot of the funny stuff around the banking system all took place around that time. But then we have a bunch of other millionaires go down with an Xbox controller and get killed. Billionaires. It was almost like a closing ritual. And what was it called? The Titan. And it turns out that the guy who owns the company, his wife was one of the survivors from the Titanic. I mean, is this, is this a joke or something? And yeah, and then you realise, well, it's just like what, what Confucius said, signs and symbols rule the world. When you start to see the world in symbols and signs, and that includes the others, you start to see rea reality starts to become malleable, and you start to get things you want. Now this is why I know people have to keep their foot in the matrix as well, I have to do that as well. But when you're fully in the matrix, I can guarantee you never get what you want in life, unless you're a billionaire. It's a it, whole system is stacked against you. But when you, tr how many of you have been in a relation? How many of you have said, and it's always happened, people have looked so hard to meet someone. I'd love to find my soulmate, and they try so hard, and they work so hard at it, and it, it goes further and further away from them. And then one day they say, "Ah, the hell with that, I'm I'm fed up," and then some girl or some guy walks in, and that's the beginning of a new life. Why? Because they thought about they're losing their attachment. To that the tightness of that subatomic fabric of having to meet that person subatomic fabric loosened and potentialities became available now the Vedas, the Hindus have told us all about this for thousands of years you can call fixity of purpose that you have a goal but you do not obsess over it you do not obsess over the goal you have a general idea of what I want and the solution will manifest in time I can't tell you many times that's happened to me in my life how the hell am I going to get out and then I say, you know what, I don't care. Pardon my bloody music, of course. But don't care. The hell with that. Shag it. And then a week later, I have it. That's because the attachment to it was the buffer that stops you from getting it. So this is what I would say before we close, right? Uh, this is all real. Everything that Pat has here. This is a great lesson. Okay? Indulge it. Enjoy it. Respect it. Very much respect it. But also... Don't become attached to any one specific element of anything. Let the, let the solutions manifest themselves for you. It's very important, this. And they always do. They always do. And there's a story, to go back to the Anglo-Saxon thing, there's a story you have to acknowledge. You can't, a lot of people go through life and they don't want to accept their called shadow work in Jungian psychology where you have to basically face yourself and say uh, I'm, not, I'm not really a good person in that way I did, shouldn't have done that and you deal with it and you try to make amends I mean the, the Vedics might call it karma 
Now when that's done, then you, ha then you can start moving on with your life. But if you don't do it, it builds up like a volcano underneath the, the surface. And it builds up and builds up, and then one day it's a psychic explosion and you'll have a nervous breakdown. Because you didn't do the shadow work, right? Uh, so a lot of us today are encouraged not to do our shadow work. We go to, and no, no, no disrespect to anybody in the mental health care profession, we're told to go to psychiatrists and psychologists and tell them stories. It, even the best ones of them will say, that's not, we really have to do the work yourself. And, and you can't medicate it out of yourself. And, or through alcohol or anything like that. But when you do that, you suddenly almost set a clean slate and you can move on. So I, I, I get people all the time who are very angry about the last three years. Say, how can we get them back? How can we deal with this? How can we get them? They, they, I lost my business. And I just say, forget about them. Just follow your dharma. Uh, do what you love the best. Follow that. And don't be plugging yourself into a solution and like a screw going into a piece of steel it will never go in and uh, that's how you do it and I think what's beautiful about today and what Pat and, uh, and Rosie have done is they've allowed us to become children again like when Pat brings us over here talks over there and we talk about Atlantis and we talk about various we have recaptured our childhood because we've stepped out of the conformity the rit of the orthodoxy and uh, we've, we're now, that wave function is now, we're seeing, it, we're understanding that. And I put my, look, I bet every single one of you going home today, and forget I wasn't here, you're going to feel better than when you arrived this morning. You're going to feel better. Why? Because you step out of the matrix. And that's a crude term, I don't like, but it's, it's the only one that people actually recognize. And you stepped into a magical world of, the veil being lifted. If we could actually carry that inside us all the time, uh, and use use things like synchronicity as a road a road map, and understand that you know when you're having a bad day, you're basically a, it's a challenge, and you're a warrior. Now some days you're a wizard, and some days you're a knight, and some days you're a thief, some days you're a coward, and that's okay as well. Uh, you have to find that. I, I think people, if you go, I think. Well, I'd ask you to do something. From here, go and look at the work of Joseph Campbell, the work of Carl Jung. And when you watch a movie or a film or a story, Irish mythology or anything, bring yourself to say, what is the real lesson here for me? And you'll be amazed how much, life, how much easier life becomes because suddenly you're not a victim of this whole nonsense. You're a, you're a participant on it because you're, you're looking at the subatomic particle and it's moving. And I'm going to go, well, I'm going to make it move the way I want. So, uh, thanks very much for coming along, and uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Does anyone have any questions? You have to. I can't hear you from there. You have to come over. I shout it. So what what do we do if we if we are if we're walking along if we're walking along Hack Farm in the middle of the night and maybe we maybe we bump into a she and we get a bit of a fright you know so what do you do how do you protect yourself and what's the best way to be going about it how do you protect yourself going in and say you give yourself a bit of fright you get a you know you get a funny feeling how do you how do you, how do you just accept it? experience of what it is and the novelty of it relish the novelty of it. Like I saw a Pine Martin first time in my life last week, and I, and I relished that experience. So treat that in the same way. Do you use iron? We're dealing with nature. Yeah. Do you use iron or salt or anything like that? No, unless there was some kind of entity that was attacking me. Like you know, yeah, then you would like use salt or something. Uh, but otherwise, no, just just acknowledge the experience and try to learn why did it happen at this time why did I see at this point why this road why me you know why are they trying to communicate with me um, they may be trying to communicate to you because they see you as a special person who can actually help them don't be negative yeah. thank you very much Charles any others ok that's good ok look after yourself thanks very much